First of all, I'd just like to thank Karen uh, for inviting me to speak here and also for organising this event. I just wanted to pick up on something she said which really struck me, which is this issue of temporality. Um, what I really want to thank her for and Ian is the opportunity to develop a body of ideas mm -hmm. and the network over time. I think the way things are going often means that we're sort of um, grabbing at sort of six months a year if we're lucky to have conversations with people and that's been so valuable in this network, that kind of development of, of, a, of a kind of body of ideas and uh, connections between us over time. So thank you very much. In the paper Mythologising Landscape, Place and Space of Cult and Myth, Professor of Scandinavian Studies Stefan Brink makes a broad study of the mythical and sacral geography of the pre-Christian landscape of early Scandinavia. He notes that people often connect myths to both places in the landscape, including ancient monuments, and to place names, but observes that myths are vulnerable to being forgotten when these mnemotechnic pegs are destroyed or forgotten. Whether this occurs as a result of a violent disruption such as a war, colonial occupation, environmental devastation, or simply the gradual process of time, the loss of myths may leave us with a sense of bereavement. Such stories testify to community spiritual knowledge and empirical understandings of place. We may also feel the loss of a way of understanding the world as numinous, and, and I just feel, you know, as an interdisciplinary researcher, often I feel out of place, but having just heard the two talks prior, I, I feel very uh, in place and very uh, interested in both of uh, the papers the speakers have just given. Um, and Brink comments that today in the secular Western world, there are practically no sacral entities that cannot be profaned. What interests me here is the potential to bring back a sense of the sacred into our relationship, both to landscape and ourselves. And it's for this reason that I'd like to talk on this panel about strategies the German 20th century artist Joseph Boyce employed in his work, because he clearly felt it was possible to revive people's deep connection with other living beings and landscapes through employing strategies to stimulate creative engagement. <laughs> I think it may be very useful to revisit his work in contemporary contexts. This photograph taken in 1974, and I'll say again 1974, I do apologise, there's a typo in the abstract, shows boys standing before the main entrance stone at Sheambu, is that the correct? Or Newgrange, the site of a Stone Age passage tomb built in around 3200 BC, of course not far from here. While Newgrange is of course a Neolithic site, it was clearly an important place for later communities that we have now referred to as Celtic. And that's a really hot potato still, that issue, so I won't go there. <laughs> but it's very interesting. In Boyce's drawing entitled The Three Energies of New Grange, which you can see next to the photograph, he sketched his interpretation of the symbols on the stone as relating to different states of energy. In the preface of the related exhibition catalogue, Carolyn Tisdall comments, on the great stone outside the tomb of the kings at Newgrange in Ireland are the carved symbols which indicate that the ancient Celts had a sophisticated knowledge of physical and spiritual energies. The three energies are the spiral, organic or implosive form, the split cell, and the diamond-shaped crystalline or explosive form. Just as an academic might relate their interpretations of a place, to, or the symbols of a place to their own conceptual frameworks, Boyce saw these symbols as an early example of the principles to which he referred in his own theory of sculpture. The passage from warm organic form, for example liquid fat, to cold crystalline form, for example solid sculpted fat. Boyce's theory outlined in this diagram depicts these two poles of sculptural possibility and suggests that all matter exists and is transformed between them through movement, or as he referred to it in German, Bewegung. In many ways, his practice constitutes a pedagogy of flux, pointing to the creative role and situation of the human being, and it occurs to me also the creative um, nature of all materials, um, of which um, the human being is a part. However, Boyce did not privilege a state of flux. Rather, he recognised that the materials all around us in the everyday world have evocative and mutable capabilities and qualities which can be shaped into new forms. 
extending to the, this to the capacity of people to form society as a kind of sculpture. In concentrating on his creative ability to shape forms, his theory evades a tendency in much contemporary academic writing on landscape to articulate place either as a state of movement and migration, which sort of seems to be a contemporary tendency, or a more romantic and static space of Heideggerian dwelling, on the other hand, in what Doreen Massey has recently recognised is a problematic binary which fails to acknowledge the inadequacy of both positions. In line with this interest in creativity, Boyce's interpretation and encounter at Newgrange was then set into play creatively as a productive form in a particular social political context. So in relation to the discussion of performances, that interests me very much. He drew the spiral on the blackboard at lecture actions given as part of the exhibition A Secret Block for a Secret Person in Ireland, which toured both north and south of the border later the same year. In this image taken of the blackboard drawn during act, an act, sorry, an action at the Crawford Art Gallery, Cork, we can see Boyce's plea at the top left-hand corner, do not use explosives. Uh, sorry. As an indication of Boyce's view, organic, implosive energy, the spiral points to other ways of using energy, and the blackboard could be seen as both a teaching vehicle and a stimulus for dialogue. Now, whether it was appropriate for him to have commented in this way on the political situation at the height of the Troubles is perhaps a moot point. And when I lived in Derry for four years, I just became very aware that the North had seen its fair share of rather naive artists, not all, parachuted in to assist in a context where local people often had an extremely astute awareness of the political complexities on the ground. However, as Christian Maria Lem Hayes has noted, these lecture actions were followed by dialogue with the audience a fact which is often not included in critical writing about them. Gregory Ulmer notes Boyce's extreme dismay that the art historians insisted on uh, not documenting the, the discussions after the, the, the lecture. In this sense, the lecture actions are clearly intended as a process-led stimulus rather than an exposition of static fact, an attempt to get things moving. In an interview with Bernard Lamarche Vadel, Boyce commented, I'm interested in a type of theory which provokes energy among people and leads them to a general discussion of their present problems. It is thus a therapeutic methodology. During his visit to Newgrange, Boyce displayed alertness to empirical information elicited both from rational observation and an intuitive and imaginative sense, reflecting in his interest in Goethean phenomenology. There's not enough time to discuss this in depth here, but suffice it to say that he was interested in working with essences, phenomenology's central questions revolving around the issue of what is perceivable and what goes, goes beyond the realm of sensory perception to the essential, which can only be apprehended through wider human faculties, such as intuition. Boyce proposed particular strategies for apprehending a spiritual, invisible element to the interrelationship with people and other living beings. In a 1977 interview with the artist, Sherman and Clues asked Boyce why particular animals re reappeared in his multiples and whether he thought that people knew their mythological meanings anymore. He replied, It has certainly died out to a large extent, but in order to prevent its total extinction, one has to work in the opposite direction and simply show that in these biological phenomena there is something that goes beyond nature. With these formulations from the world of animals, I mean to say something about the connected meanings in nature, the environment, the connected meanings of the forms of life which live with man and which we know as little as we know ourselves. Nowadays people know little about the essence of things and they don't know much anymore about the meaning of life and the meaning of the whole world context. That's why there are so many people now who can find no meaning in life and who kill themselves. All the connected meanings are missing. Using the example of an animal, you can get to an answer to the question, what is the human being? How is he meant? And I really loved that, that issue of that it was almost hermeneutic. Well, how, how is the human being meant? Boyce's in interpretation of the main entrance stone at Newgrange and his later application of this understanding in the Cork lecture action also appears to reflect a strategy of working in the opposite direction. The spiral is drawn to trigger a form of spiritual and energetic response in the audience to stimulate their creativity and remind them that their human capacities go beyond work with the immediately apparent aspect of material existence to a spiritual realm, 
this may all seem very, I'm really interested to talk to Ronan about this afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this may all seem very um, dated, I don't know. For Boyce, everyone was an artist, although not in the narrow sense of a professional artist. Artists transform substance and materials, and Boyce believed that art was, as Tucker puts it, the essence of humanity's capacities. Only from deep, sustained reflection upon the nature and purpose of creative activity could essential social changes arise. In this sense, Boyce's position does not appear Hegelian. He firmly emphasised that his central focus was the creative potential of human beings and how people will make sense in relation to other living beings and places, rather than positing a notion of absolute knowledge. Stefan Brink argues in conclusion that in pre-Christian times, people felt able to allow the landscape to be sacred and numinous, as he puts it, metaphysically charged in different ways with different degrees of energy, whereas in the contemporary West, the dominance of secular thought has taught us to understand landscape purely in terms of raw material resources. He also says, however, I'm just going to add this in, that there is a surprising continuity of observation at sacred sites in Scandinavia. And so I think we also need to um, observe the continuity of, of attraction to these uh, particular sacred sites. Boyce's strategies suggest, I think, that such degrees of energy are not simply notional, but really perceived by people, and that they might be more fully apprehended and galvanised once again through working in the opposite direction. Rather than simply regarding Newgrange as a mnemotechnic peg upon which Neolithic and then Celtic myth had hung, Boyce actively engaged with the way in which peoples rework cosmologies through interpretive phenomenological encounters with the physical and spiritual qualities of such sites, interpretations which are not just rational, but creative, intuitive and potentially spiritually transformative. In this sense, one might say that for the artist, nothing had been profaned that might not be made sacred again. However, Boyce believed that a return to old myths was no longer either possible nor desirable, proposing that an approach that acknowledged and promoted people's self-conscious work with physical and spiritual materials to keep society and the individual healthy, which he referred to as social sculpture, was a more viable future position. For Boyce, then, it could be said that landscape was not therapeutic in itself, although the movements of the landscape are energetic and creative. Rather, the therapeutic aspect lay in the physical and spiritual encounters between people and living landscapes, and the way in which the energy of these interactions could be galvanised in the direction of productive, productive discussion and co-creation in response to pressing issues. This does not appear to be mapping practice in a conventional sense, although it does bring into view spectral traces of human communities in the past, but rather a process of working in the opposite direction to relocate and revivify latent human creative capacities and hidden topographies of the soul in a connection with outer landscapes. This was an approach that he clearly saw as productive in the widest sense, and given the urgent economic and environmental dilemmas we face today, the artist precedent continues to excite both my intellect and my imagination. Thank you.